Hey everyone, and welcome to a very special panel part of Seattle Pride. I'm Matt Baum. I'm a writer and pop culture critic based here in Seattle. And today we're going to be looking at objects that are part of uh, Mopop's exhibit, Rise Up Stonewall and the LGBTQ Rights Movement, a chronicle of the pop culture, politics, challenges, victories of the queer liberation movement. It's presented in partnership with the Freedom Forum. We have some amazing histories, some good, some bad, some in between. And we also have a panel of queer culture experts. We're going to be discussing the ways that the uh, history embodied in these objects has impacted our lives in the past and still impacts our lives to this day. And our panelists uh, have no idea what objects they're gonna be looking at. So we're gonna be seeing their reactions uh, as it happens. Uh, so I'd like to welcome our esteemed panel. Uh, we have Isabella Price, a filmmaker, writer, costume designer, podcast host, burlesque performer, horror film expert. Isabella, thanks so much for being here. No problem, no problem. Thank you for having me. We also have Devlin Camp, the host of the podcast Queer Serial, bringing queer history to life. It is a thrill to be joined by you. Thanks for having me. I'm very excited. And Kristen Russo, writer and educator, host of Buffering the Vampire Slayer podcast, founder of My Kid is Gay. It is a delight to see you. Yeah, delight to see you as well. Yay. Well, uh, with no further ado, let's jump right into uh, the images and let's put our first one up on screen. So here we have, this is one of the first rainbow flags. Uh, it was created by Gilbert Baker in San Francisco in the 70s. Uh, it was actually at the behest of Harvey Milk. Uh, Harvey Milk challenged Gilbert to come up with an image that could represent the community. Until then, it was frequently uh, the pink triangle, which was something that was used in concentration camps and had um, a pretty heavy, dark uh, past associated with it. So uh, Harvey challenged Gilbert to come up with something more uplifting. Uh, and this is what he created. As you can see, there's the, the color arrangement is a little different than uh, what we have today. Uh, but uh, that was one of the, the very first uh, rainbow flags to have flown. Uh, so I just want to get like panel's first reaction to, to, to seeing this. What, is it, what does it feel like to see the very first rainbow, or one of the first rainbow flags? It's gorgeous. You Feels know? Pretty, oh, sorry. You go ahead. No, no. <laughs> No, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's so, it's like when you see like one of the first like American flags, you know, it's just so, um, uh, to be able to see uh, it, um, even though when I first saw it, I was like, what's missing in this one? This was a little different. Um, uh, it's really awesome to see. And I understand it makes you feel good, you know, understanding that you need to have something that's a little bit more optimistic and the rainbow makes you feel good, so. Yeah, I, I was gonna say it feels retro. Like you, you put that wonderfully. Like it's the one of the first American flags. It feels retro to see just the hor the vertical stripes rather than I'm so used to now seeing the progress flag with the trans flag and the black and brown stripes worked in. So it's like, oh, a throwback. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I I agree. I mean, I think you know it's a, like a symbol of of the way in which I think uh, communities initially were coming together at that time, you know? And like, you can feel that. Like the first thing that I noticed on this is this, like the stitching and just thinking about like, who did that? Like who stitched this, who stitched these pieces together? Um, so it is, it's it's really beautiful um, to think about that time in, in history uh, and where we are now, right? Cause we all, I think everyone in this uh, group thought the same thing. Like we're all very much flying the flag with the brown and black and trans uh, triangle in the corner, but this is definitely the origin and it's it's really cool. There's a great story about Gilbert um, making this flag by hand. Like in, in the beginning, it was just him sewing in his apartment late at night and dyeing all of the fabric in his washing machine. Uh, you know, like it was a hand, really a, a handmade thing. Um, and, and I'd love to hear from you all. Like where have, have there been times when, when you've displayed the flag or like, do you remember your first rainbow flag or, or, or times <laughs> that it's affected you? Uh, yeah, I remember my first one. I think I got it from Spencer's Gifts, um, and <laughs> I uh, hung it up. Uh, I'm I lived uh, for a long time in Texas, and so that was like a a real you know f you to hang up the the rainbow flag outside of your apartment window. Um, and so I hung it up. I think in my dorm room, um, and that was kind of the first. Uh, I remember seeing it as I was like walking home you know maybe drunk who knows um uh, and just seeing that one window that has the rainbow flag hanging out of it and being like that's 
that's me so yeah yeah I I it still brings me joy yeah I was about to tell Spencer's gift story too <laughs> they were, oh, they were no I don't have a Spencer gift story <laughs> <laughs> they no. were they were so rough back in the day. Back in the day. <laughs> it's like all the little rainbow knickknacks. And yeah. I got a t-shirt there with um, it had like the the male bathroom symbol, which now also seems outdated, but it's like the two little male bathroom symbols side by side, and they were all different rainbow colors. And I wore it to school on the first day of my sophomore year because everyone already heard I was gay and I was like <laughs> rainbow. <laughs> Oh, I Thank never you. got a rainbow flag at Spencer Gifts. I'm so upset with myself. Not too uh, late. <laughs> yeah, but I, I mean, I think for me, I associate it mostly with moving to New York City. Um, I was out um, like in the beginning of college, uh, but I, I wasn't like at rainbow flag out until I moved to, uh, the, to the city. And so like my first few early 20s, like me being in my early 20s going to Pride, I would just be like literally covered in rainbows. You know, like that was, that's what I see most when I think back to my memory of a rainbow. Uh, I, my association with the rainbow, my first was uh, a necklace with little interlocking rainbow rings that I got at the kiosk outside of a Spencer's gift. Oh, <laughs> it's literally at the mall. Like, I don't know why we all have, like, this was like the rainbow depot, apparently. Uh, but yeah, it was a little, it was a little rainbow uh, interlocking links uh, on the necklace. And it was very controversial that like somebody was wearing like in high school that somebody, oh, he's got a rainbow. Oh, everybody's got talking about the rainbow, the rainbow necklace. Does it mean something? Oh, here's what it means. And you know, it, it's got this sort of the innocuous who could be opposed to a rainbow <laughs> aspect that you, you can blend in a little bit if you need to. Uh, there's some plausible deniability there where it's not quite like the pink triangle or the lambda symbol, or um, I don't know, there, there, there's so many other miscellaneous symbols and ways of signifying that you're a part of this, um, part of a, a subculture. Uh, and the, the rainbow, you know, has, has a really nice optimism. Well, I remember that in school, like, you know, the first time that kids were like, you're wearing rainbow. Don't you know what that means? You're wearing the rainbow. Doing, do you know what what it what they say about people who wear rainbows? You know, and it was this whole thing of being like a kid and being like, oh, I just love rainbows and not really knowing what exactly it meant. And then when it kind of turned into this whole thing of like wearing rainbows means you're gay, and then being like, cool, great. So then we're gonna keep wearing rainbows. <laughs> You know, the idea of, of when that first started hitting in pop culture um, and how it became coded, um, uh, but it, it was invisible, but coded. And if you knew, you knew. Um, and this great way of kind of communicating with other people that like we knew and not a, necessarily everyone knew exactly if you wore a rainbow, then that meant that you were gay. It's still kind of the same thing. Like if you wear rainbows, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're queer, but you can kind of, kind of sense a little signal, you know? I'm kind of looking at you, you know? So I feel like that's the great thing about the rainbow is that it is, it, it's innocuous, um, but it's there. Uh, it's symbolic, invisible, but highly visible at the same time, so yeah. I had such a different experience with rainbows. Like in my mind, like the the rainbow, like putting a rainbow on my body was as blatant as I could get, you know, like it made me the most nervous. Like, you know, wearing like Converse sneakers or like zip up hoodies or, you know, a Tegan and Sarah t-shirt or like, <laughs> like there were like other things that like I found like, oh, well maybe, you know, um, but the rainbow felt so, like I felt so, so visible um, with rainbows at, at that time. I'm just curious, question for everybody. Do you have symbols that you wear today? Like, do you still wear a rainbow? Or is there something else that you, that you put on your body or your car or whatever? I think the, the biggest one for me is the Black Lives Matter BLM. That feels as dangerous as, as maybe wearing rainbow before. You know, this idea that if I'm wearing BLM anything um, and I, you know, go back home to visit my family or if I'm just at the wrong place at the wrong time or just standing at the grocery store, is somebody going to, you know, like do something to me? And that feels like a very purposeful thing 
to to wear something that says BLM you know what it means and you know what I mean when I when I'm wearing that and so it it also feels very risky at the same time yeah similarly I I got a, a t-shirt of uh, a bunch of children it's a it's an animated t-shirt of a bunch of children of different nations holding hands around a burning cop car <laughs> and I know I'm, I gotta be really choosy about where I go out to wearing that you know I'm from Indiana so I could I relate to you there <laughs> drop the link let me know where that is I want to know it's a great shirt <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean I'm sort of like jumping off of what you're both talking about at this point but I I will say that I live in a house by myself for the first time um and I'm not in New York City I was in New York City for like 20 years I'm in upstate New York and um I just moved into this house in December and like the sun is out, the, the grass is growing and I'm planning to put a Black Lives Matter like flag in front of my house. But the feeling that it brings is that like, it's like, I know that this, I know that this is what I believe and I know that this is important, but also like it does, it does feel vulnerable in a way that uh, Isabella, I agree. It's like the, how it felt to wear a rainbow a while back. Um, yeah. Well, so on the topic of uh, activism and putting a stake in the ground, let's take a look at our second image. We can get that up on screen. Uh, so this is the cover of the ACT UP newsletter, uh, 1988 in Los Angeles, uh, art there by uh, Bradley Rader. Um, so ACT UP, as I'm sure a lot of folks know, was a really pivotal organization uh, during the uh, early and, and into the you know later days of the uh, epidemic. Um, you know, coming out of a history of really uh, confrontational, disruptive uh, zaps and protests where uh, it wasn't enough just to make your voice heard, but you really had to get in people's faces and um, uh, make, uh, basically, stop stop the presses and make people pay attention to you. Uh, silence equals death was uh, one of the, the, the big prominent slogans that came out of ACT UP. So they would uh, do die-ins on Wall Street where they would disrupt the traffic and just, you know, put chalk outlines around the people there to symbolize the, the lives that have been lost. They shut down the FDA on one occasion, a huge action. Um, and uh, it was a real change from tactics of decades past that were much more about uh, respectability and fitting in and not challenging people too much. Uh, and of course, one of their big targets uh, back in the 80s was uh, Dr. Fauci. Uh, he was uh, one of the people who was a pivotal force at the, the FDA. And uh, when um, ACT UP confronted him, he listened, he invited them in. Uh, and uh, we see it today with uh, him doing, continuing to do work around uh, pandemics. So um, one of the questions I want to put to you all is, is an organization like ACT UP with, with their tactics getting in people's faces and, and um, you know, really shouting, shouting at people until they were listened to, uh, was it just made them impossible to ignore. Um, what do you feel is, is the right balance of working within the system and making allies, forming allies and getting along versus being confrontational and, and working outside the system and demanding change? Super light question, Matt. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> We've learned so much about modern activism because of groups like this, especially like this, because there have been so many times when people have protested in the last century when no one would listen and they made people listen when it counted the most. Like one of my favorite ACT UP protests uh, or one of the, my favorite actions of theirs was when um, there was a senator that was defund trying to defund um, HIV Med, uh, HIV care. And so when he wasn't home and his family wasn't home, this small group of ACT UP members went to his house and put a giant condom over his house and brought the news out at, at the crack of dawn to make sure it was captured before the police came. It was a huge undertaking, but because it was so funny, it made huge headlines. They, they taught us how to make a joke out of it. And it's, a, that's the way we've got to do it if no one's going to listen. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think that, you know, the difference is, is that now you can't just tweet at somebody and say like, how do you feel about this? You know, like you had to be more drastic about things. Um, and so often when we talk about protesting, there's always this kind of group of people who are like, I agree with your message. I just wish that you didn't like go out and stop traffic and interrupt me and things like that. And it's like, well, what is the purpose of a protest if not to disrupt things and to make you think about things you know and like this idea 
that we often forget when we talk about the AIDS crisis is how much silence there was, how many people did not even talk about it. We're not even talking about the people whose lives were, were being lost constantly. And the silence was deafening, you know? And it's like I said, it's not like now where it's like, why aren't you tweeting about this? Why aren't you putting up an Instagram iconographic about this? Like people just did not even speak about it. And it was horrific, you know? And so I think that act up i i'm constantly inspired by i i call them antics because they were antics they were they were wild some of the time you know they got out of hand some of the time i didn't think they went far enough like it to me that's so inspirational we just had a whole year of just the most intense protests that i've ever been in um and the entire time i was thinking about the act up i was thinking like this is the world is watching and they're going to be watching our actions now um and they the act up participants had so much to lose um they had everything to lose uh and to me that's that's so inspirational and i i, I think it's great i think their work is is historic you know for the whole world yeah i i think that i first learned of act up um you know i came out in 98 and um I think that like coming out in the late 90s you were sort of on the heels of this like this like and uh, on the heels is the wrong way to say it right because i think that like this work was the heartbeat that sort of like informed our work as like late 90s just realizing that we were queer and so i learned about act up first through the musical rent um and like the, and, and rent was like such an in point i mean that's complicated for a million other reasons that could have its own panel but uh at the time i i loved that musical and I and I it was like my gateway to learning more about ACT UP and to learning more about the HIV AIDS crisis um, that was sort of like ju just I mean ending is not the correct uh, way to say it but that like the crisis itself was changing shape and changing form by that time and um, to your question Matt about like the balance it it hit me because I think that I was always um, I always believed that like in terms of pol like politics this was the way that like uprooting and turning things over and um, being in people's faces was the way and the only way. But personally, uh, and to speak to your point on silence, uh, Isabella, like personally in my personal life with my extended family members, I was mostly silent. Uh, and that has shifted drastically over the past like five years or so um, in a way where I have realized that, you know, one informs the other. And I think that that's really important. And I think that that was a critical piece of the of ACT UP's message. It's just that for me, um, I had the privilege to sort of sit in what I thought was a comfortable silence for everyone. And it wasn't, is the truth. But um, I think, I don't think there is a balance. I think that like, fucking shit up is the only way at this point <laughs> <laughs> yes yes i agree i agree and that's so interesting because it's come back around again you know it's the same sort of thing with all the things that are going on in this country you know not talking about police brutality not talking about economic injustice trans rights is a form of violence in itself you know um and so speaking out and using using whatever platform you have even if it's as small as putting your pronouns in your profile it's still you know an act you're acting up you know <laughs> like mm -hmm. even that and I think that that's a really powerful powerful lineage that act up has left us with so. yeah it's like putting the BLM flag in your yard like it, it's vulnerable it's it's it can be hard to, to do if you're in the wrong in the, a neighborhood where you've got terrible neighbors but it's it, you're putting yourself out there in the same way that act up was yeah uh let's um move on to our next image So this may look like, um, you know, a fairly, you know, innocuous, like, oh, wait, uh, just a, a, a tennis racket? Um, this is, uh, this tennis racket belonged to Martina Navratilova, um, a person uh, who has kind of a, a mixed history with, uh, with the queer community. Um, so Martina, if you're not familiar, uh, was a, uh, still is a, a, a major figure in, in professional tennis. Uh, in the early 80s, she did an interview with uh, the New York Daily News, um, and she came out uh, as, then she, uh, identified as bisexual, later she identified as a lesbian, um, talked about her 
romantic past. She dated uh, Rita Mae Brown, who's the author of Ruby Fruit Jungle. Um, she was, and this was a huge deal at the time. She was rated number one for many years, number one tennis player, women's tennis player in the world for years. Um, and it cost her a lot. She says that she lost about $10 million in endorsements uh, after she came out. Uh, she remained very active in politics uh, and activism. She uh, campaigned against um, uh, Amendment 2 in Colorado, which was basically set the stage for the um, many years later uh, decriminalization of uh, homosexuality, the Supreme Court. Um, and then uh, she's also, you know, you got this mixed history because in recent years, she's been really uh, outspoken about uh, the exclusion, she, about, you know, she's in favor of excluding trans women from uh, sports. Uh, she signed a letter just a few years ago, uh, you know, affirming that position. So, uh, you know, it's, it's very, it's troubling on one hand to have a figure who seems like an ally and seems like, you know, they're, we're, we're all on the same page. Uh, and then... Uh, turns around and, and and wants to exclude people, and you know I think it's um, you know it, it brings up a lot of mixed feelings to to see this to see this object. Um, and I want to turn this to the panel. Like, wh what do you what do we do about that? Like, how do you handle um, someone that you think of as an ally, but also holds a position that is that is counter to to what you know to to basically where the the arc the moral arc of the universe is heading. Well, I, just to drive home that I'm, I have Southern roots, as my grandmother used to say, not all kin are my kind. Um, and that means that just because they are part of you, part of your community, your family, does not mean that they are always on your side. Um, and people are complex and people have complex issues um, and they have complex feelings. And you can be very much um, a, a, a gay icon, a gay, a, a queer, advocate and also be transphobic. Um, you can be trans and be transphobic. You can be black and be racist. You, you can be gay and still be homophobic. God knows we've all encountered those people. Like it's just, it's just a thing, you know? And I think it's very complex. I can give her her flowers for what she did at the time. And I can tell her, you know, like that's that, I can recognize that greatness in her and what she sacrificed. But at the same time, like times are different. Um, and, you know, there are things that she is wrong about. Um, and as you were talking, Matt, I was thinking about how, um, right now, we have so many laws that are being enacted to exclude trans children from sports. Um, and this idea of, I think it's Title IX, and how great Title IX was at the time um, uh, before all of this, where we were just like, this is great, this is going to help protect girls, and how that is being used to disenfranchise trans women, it's a uh, trans people. It's remarkable to me. It's so complex, our history, um, and it, it it's full of idiosyncrasies a lot of the time. Yeah, I'm always hopeful that the people in our community that have terrible points of view like this just come around with time and, and more education and we're talking about it. Like I'm, I'm put in mind as people like Randy Wicker, who was uh, a Mattachine activist, and um, was was later very transphobic towards Sylvia Rivera and, and would misgender her in his articles. And and then he, over time, he slowly came around and then Sylvia and Marsha P. Johnson both ended up being his roommates and they became great friends. And, and, and nowadays he described himself as a former male chauvinist pig, his exact words, you know. He had so many points of view that were wrong at the time. And, and now in his eighties, he's able to admit when things were wrong. And, I know that is like a, a, a rare example of a person who lives long enough to know their mistakes. And hopefully she does too. And hopefully Caitlyn Jenner does too. Ooh. <laughs> but it's exactly, that's all I was thinking about when we were, when you were both talking. But I, I love giving her her flowers. That's such a beautiful way of putting it that like there is, there is uh, acknowledgement that is deserved there, but the truth of it is that I think like if you are in one or many ways uh, a part of a marginalized community, you have a, you have a bit more access perhaps to understanding that everyone's perspective is not your own and, and to listening, um, but it's not, uh, it's not a guarantee. Um, and so, you know, I think there are some people who will continue learning and continue listening uh, and some people who 
were there to uh, advocate for their way of living because they understood their way of living and they couldn't get past that or they can't get past that. And so, you know, I, I'm always a, an advocate of like giving the information, having the conversation. And then if there's not a response and if there's not positive movement, the, your energy is better used elsewhere. Um, and now I'm adding to that and they can still keep their flowers. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, you can recognize it. It's the same thing for, for Caitlin, right? It's like, mm -hmm. Caitlin, like, good job and everything like that. I wish you would have several seats, um, but I can still <laughs> recognize, you know, the work. And our community is not a monolith. The community is not coming from the same eco economic, socioeconomic backgrounds. We're not all coming from the same racial backgrounds. And there are so many intersectional issues inside of the community and transphobia has been one of the biggest ones I think. I think transphobia inside of the queer community um, has been an issue for a very long time but because of the fact that we were so focused for so long on trying to live uh, we really couldn't even focus on cleaning our own houses for a really long time. We just wanted to have houses for a really long time, you know, and now that we've sort of gotten past that, we can sort of look around and be like, actually, we are living in filth and we need to figure this out soon. Um, and I think that this is one of the complex issues that we could only really talk about once we were sort of past the the threshold which maria helped us to get past of being able to even be visible and to even live and so now we got to go deeper you know and i will give her credit for that so let's take a look at our next image here let's put up our fourth image uh this is the cover of pause magazine featuring pedro zamora uh from the real world uh, he was a super influential figure uh, for a period in the 90s. Uh, he's a Cuban immigrant and sex worker or sex educator uh, who auditioned for The Real World when The Real World was uh, very, very new and reality television was was still kind of in its infancy. People didn't really know what it was going to be or become. Um, and he suddenly just got this national spotlight that he could use as a sex educator to teach the entire country and you know people who were watching around the world about HIV. Um, you know, and it, like it's impossible to overstate like it's just how prominent he was uh, when that episode, when that season aired. Uh, Bill Clinton said that uh, now nobody can say that they don't know somebody who has AIDS uh, because because Pedro brought it to you know put put a face uh, for a lot of people who were like, well, I don't know how this affects me. Now there's a sympathetic figure that you know on television, uh, and you can see his life, and you can see uh, his partner, and you can see uh, how it, it affects his health. Um, it was, uh, it was a, you know, just a, a major pivotal figure uh, in pop culture in the 90s. Um, so I want to, you know, put this, put this out to the panel. Um, were you watching um, uh, the real world when this happened? Or were you aware of Pedro Zamora when, uh, when he was coming out and when he was in front of people? Yeah, I, I was. Yeah, I did. Um, uh, this was, like you said, it was, it was so early in the kind of reality TV. Um, and so everybody was like really big into this idea of this huge, being able to, this huge violation of people's privacy <laughs> that we were all so excited to do <laughs> and to see inside of these people's lives. And I remember, uh, when I was really young, but I remember when Pedro passed and it was huge. I mean, it was just, it was because because of the fact that we got to know Pedro intimately and it wasn't this sort of image of this person who's wasting away a black and white photo in a magazine or something like that. It was somebody who you knew what they liked, their laugh, their smile, you know, how funny, how sweet they were. Um, and to, to know that they had died from something like this after so many years of just the inhumane treatment of people. And I think the whole, the whole world, really Pedro's contribution to the whole conversation cannot be understated. The whole world shifted because suddenly that cruelty that, that ignorance, not being able to look at people, not being able to see the pain shifted. Suddenly we had all seen it and it was in front of the whole entire world. And it was just, it was, it, I, the, the impact of that culturally, huge, huge. Yeah, that's the first thing that I remembered just like viscerally. Like I remember watching the show and I remember, you know, being invested, I mean, invested in the show for a million reasons, but certainly Pedro as somebody who was out and somebody who was vocal about being positive was 
really impactful. But the thing I remember most is learning that he had passed. Um, and just, you know, I think, I don't remember what year that even was. Do, do you have that information, Matt? Of like, yeah, I believe when it was 94. Was Okay. So, so yeah, so I'm like 14, 15. And um, I just, I, I had like a very deep response to it, but I don't think, I think like at that point in your evolution as a, as a queer person, you're like sort of trying to figure out why you're having the response that you're having. So I don't think that I really knew at the time what was happening to like to me or the world in the conversation but I think that like as years passed right this and so many other moments like came into focus of oh that's why I felt so, I mean maybe I would have felt the exact same way had I not been queer but I think that there was a deep tie to seeing the vulnerability of this person and then also having as a person who did not live through the AIDS crisis um like a, a very very personal connection or feeling like I had a personal connection to somebody who was no longer there. I was a, oh, um, I was two in 1994, so I wasn't aware of him at all until college. Um, I studied uh, television production in college, so I learned about him in my history of television class, and it was like a big event to learn about in TV history because he was so huge, and, and then, you know, like you were saying, Bill Clinton was saying, now everybody knows, but I don't think there was even people, there were that many people on TV for me to see after him, for me to understand. I learned what ACT UP was and AIDS really was from Rent, like, like you were saying. So he must, I, I can't even fathom the impact he must have had in the early 90s. And to do it at a time when queer people had just been spending the 60s and 70s and 80s fighting off the, the belief that we were sick and then for, for a virus to come along and prove that we were sick, it, it must have uh, been a, a horrible, difficult experience for him to do this so publicly in front of the whole world. And at a time when there was absolutely no benchmark for what it was to be a reality television star. Like that didn't even, yeah. like there, like every facet of his existence, there was like no touchstone for it, for him. Or like, you know, somebody he could reach out to and say like, what was it like for you when you did even this little piece of what I'm doing right now? It was all so new. Uh, and I'm sure that, I'm sure that like, he didn't just like many of them didn't uh, who signed up for those first reality shows didn't understand like what that impact would be on them in the long run. And, you know, how, how could he have known how his story was going to impact us to, to this point? It's 2021 and we are talking about him and his legacy now. I can't imagine that he knew that then. Yeah. It's, so, it's so brave. It's like mind blowingly brave to even think about, you know, mm -hmm at a time when people still believe that you could get AIDS from like shaking someone's hand, you know, like for, for Pedro to, to, to essentially make himself a pariah because now the whole world knows your status. And it's still difficult today for people to come out with their status, you know? Um, and we're still working some, God, 20, 30, do not make me do math. <laughs> later um, <laughs> none of us there. want you to do that math anyway so it's <laughs> better that you don't <laughs> and so like you know like we're still fighting the stigma of the status you know and and the idea that this this person was like I'll do this in front of the whole world um not having treatment not knowing what their life was going to be like after that knowing that the entire world was still so ignorant about it um, I, the, the bravery of that, having no precedence uh, to me, I just, I, I can't imagine that. It, I just, I really, there's so few people that brave that I could think of, of in my life. Yeah, people are still, uh, struggling to disclose their HIV status on RuPaul's drag race. Like yeah. that, that's how difficult it still is. That's a, a really amazing comparison, actually, because I mean, Drag Race is kind of, you know, particularly for queer people, the benchmark for reality television today. Mm -hmm. And to see how um, brave he was about, Pedro was about, about leading this conversation uh, as, a, as a sex educator, you know, in the 90s. And now today, you know, people go on TV to, to be, for whatever reasons they, they do, um, but find themselves in the position of, of you know, being able to be an, an educator for people, you know, a role model, whether they want it to be or not. Um, one of the amazing things that he did, one of the trailblazing things about Pedro's work is, is that he essentially, he became America's sex educator. 
um, kind of overnight um, and at a time when there was, you know, virtually no, I, I know that I personally did not have queer inclusive sex education when I was in high school. Nothing, nothing about it contemplated the existence of, of gay people, even though looking back, I am fairly confident that many of my teachers, in fact, I know now, like having known them after as an adult, many of my teachers were gay, many of my teachers were queer, but it wasn't spoken about. And um, yeah, we just like the, the existence of queer inclusive sex education and also um, healthcare uh, was another issue that that Pedro really brought to people's attention. He couldn't get health insurance. He couldn't get coverage for uh, for his treatment uh, because he was HIV positive at the time. Uh, MTV paid for his medical care um, after he was on the show. Uh, and to this day, you know, we still have Republicans trying to uh, undermine the non-discrimination and, um, you know, the, the the articles of Obamacare that uh, ensure that people with pre-existing conditions can be covered. So uh, it's, you know, it's it's an existing, it's an enduring struggle. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's take a look at uh, our next image. Let's bring that next one up. Speaking of television. Ooh, here she yeah. is. <laughs> There she is. <laughs> oh, wow. Wowzers. All right. Yeah. So to, to frame this, to put some context on the, the famous uh, Ellen cover of Time magazine, uh, this uh, happened, I think, just like a few weeks before the, the famous The Puppy episode uh, of her show aired. Um, so-called, it's called the puppy episode because executives said, we need to do something with the show. We need to shake it up, give the character a puppy. And so that, this was how, this was how the show responded. Um, but there she is, uh, one of the, and again, like impossible to overstate just what a big deal this was. I mean, there were watch parties. So many people watched this coming out episode, something like equal to the population of Canada, just in the, in the U S like the number of television sets that were tuned to her coming out episode. Uh, one of the most prominent uh, queer people in the country uh, for a time. Um, I remember watching the the puppy episode, gosh, um, by myself at home, my parents were out. And so I was able to watch it at home, um, but also knew that there were watch parties happening. And I just like, it was one of those times when I felt this, I, I was very young, I was a mm, teenager. So I think I was 16. So knowing that I was watching something in the company of people that I didn't even know, couldn't even see, wasn't with, but that they were there, they were out there. Um, my, 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 my folks were out there. Uh, it really like, that is a, just a dividing line in queer representation in pop culture. Uh, the, the Ellen episode, we, you know, it, it's like the year zero of, uh, <laughs> out gay characters on television. Uh, what were your, so I, I want to turn this over to everybody else. What were your experiences with, with Ellen's coming out? How did you receive that? I uh, was somehow like not like, this was not a moment for me. I mean, I, like Ellen certainly is a, I have a million feelings about Ellen in general, but like, I didn't watch this episode when it aired and it didn't like, it didn't hold that for me. And I, I don't know why that is. Um, I remember like learning about it after the fact, um, but I didn't watch the episode uh, in real time. And I, I, I mean, I think that this is like a, a, another really good example of someone who was incredibly brave to do what she did um, and who connects back to me to what you were saying earlier, Matt, about like how much do we do to make people comfortable with us and how much do we do to um, flip it, to like really flip it, to really uh, like upend things and, and turn things. And I think that like, I don't want to take us too far off the topic of this moment, but Ellen to me is like a really big vessel of that conversation of um, moving forward in time and listening and, and continuing to be active. Yeah, Ellen meant means so much to me, despite recent events and, and recent things we've learned. Um, and I remember watching that last season of Ellen and, my, and, and I remember watching the puppy episode and my dad was watching it and I was uh, re reading or playing with toys or something in the same room and pretending not to watch because I knew it was something I wasn't supposed to be watching because my dad had already gotten on to me about being sad about Rosie O'Donnell going off the air. <laughs> And so I knew <laughs> there was something wrong with this and I shouldn't be listening, but I needed to know what she was doing. And then as I got, when I came out, I read, I read both of her books at the time. I rewatched all of Ellen. I got the DVD secretly from the library. So my, my mom wouldn't know I was watching. And she, she broke ground and, and no matter what she's become and, and how jaded she's become and how many times she's said in her own standup that she doesn't want to be a gay icon. Uh, she is, despite her best intentions. She she means a lot to all of us. Well, 
yeah yeah I I agree I mean I remember <laughs> I remember watching it um and not getting why it was such a big deal um I remember watching it and being like first of all girl the signals were out there like like if <laughs> Ellen was in a lot of rom-coms at the time and if you've ever seen Ellen's early rom-coms they are so awkward my god it's awful <laughs> Um, oh, so remember, Mr. Wright, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Wright, there's so many of these. Like they were trying to make Ellen this, like I don't even know, like this Meg Ryan type of person, but there was always just something off um, about it. <laughs> and so when this happened, I I feel like I was like, oh, well, that explains it. Um, and you know, of not only going out on top because Ellen was just so popular at the time. Um, and having this kind of conversation, I think that this ties into maybe a conversation we'll have later about marriage equality, where it was like, you know, suddenly you could, you were demystified of queer people. Suddenly it was like, the queers are in the house, they're just like you, they look like you, they talk like you, and there was, there was none of this kind of mystique about like, you know, like they're out, in in some leather bar you know like <laughs> trolling around teaching softball to girls like you know it was like never really it was always this kind of I, other idea instead ellen was like oh no they're just you got it you got you got the softball joke i see you um <laughs> and so this idea of like you know that it was just ellen was just a normal regular average person um and i really think that that kind of demystified this whole um, uh, this this stigma against a lot of what queerness was and the sort of deviancy that queerness had always been attributed to and that queerness actually is the most mundane thing on earth um, and it's just so boring <laughs> um, and the most average white woman you've ever seen can also be a lesbian and it was just <laughs> that to me is really the power that Ellen holds <laughs> So, um, and so I, it's complicated. Her her recent kind of history complicates things, um, but at the same time, like that was just rocked. It rocked the whole nation. So yeah, it's huge. Will and Grace premiered the next season that fall after Ellen got canceled. It, was it, it really and, that soon? Yeah, wow. yeah. And and, wow. and people, you know, my my own grandparents and and Joe Biden, they they all credit Will and Grace as the thing that blew their mind. And would we have had Will and Grace if Ellen didn't come out? It, it, she she broke the ground. That's I think there's point. no question. Someone who watches a lot of television from the '90s, um, <laughs> I think like I, I look at what came before. Um, and I think the thing that was remarkable about uh, the show is that um, it was a person who was queer in real life who was coming out as a queer character and also someone who had autonomy over the show. It wasn't, you know, there, there, there were plans to potentially make Chandler gay on Friends. And I think that would have been super different, um, that it was just that that would have been an actor who was straight in real life playing gay on a show. But um, I, I think that there, there's no question that that Will and Grace and, you know, the things that came after Glee, for example, like I, I don't think you'd see um, shows focusing on main characters in the same way uh, for, for, for better or worse, because there were also some flops. There was uh, I don't know if you all remember Normal Ohio. Do you remember mm -hmm. that one? No. That lasted less than a season. It was John Goodman playing a gay man who moves back home to, to be with his family. Um, and the whole joke is he is a gay guy but he's normal. And, <laughs> and like after Ellen did, it was sort of like, yeah, of course we know gay people are normal. So, so what else have you got? Right. Uh, yeah. Well, so it, it's interesting. Cause I feel like I also watched it to see what my parents reacted, how mm. my parents reacted mm. to it. And then how they reacted to it also would tell me how I should respond to them or how I should act around them. Mm. Um, but there was before Ellen, there was a show called Rock that was on HBO and Rock had a gay character uh, and it was this all black show. Um, and that was kind of the first time that I ever was like sort of watching the way that my parents responded to that to sort of see like, okay, like they're, they're my parents act to their credit um, uh, were very, very, open and and they I didn't have as many of the struggles coming out to my parents um and I think the first time that Ellen came out I think my mom was like well with that haircut I mean you know <laughs> <laughs> I'm so was, glad that you, it was over that, with 
rock is is such an important one. It was it's the first that I know of the first uh, American primetime um, marriage ceremony to appear on uh, on on television, uh, and also one of the first uh, recurring uh, gay wow. characters. I believe the first re black recurring gay character on television. Russell um, Uncle Russell was the character played by Richard Roundtree Shaft. Rock was such a huge show in the black community, and so to have a gay character in the nineties who is black and outwardly gay. I just, that was, to, in my community, that was, that was huge. It was just, yeah, it was really huge. So, yeah. Well, on the topic of uh, marriages, uh, let's check out our sixth and final image. So these are, you might not like recognize them just, just to look at them, uh, but these are the two rings that belonged to uh, Jim Obergefell and John Arthur, uh, the, one of the couples in the lawsuits that uh, overturned the, the federal uh, bans on marriage equality. Um, they, uh, I believe it was uh, 2015, uh, Supreme Court ruled that uh, state laws banning marriage equality had to, had to go away. Uh, Edie Windsor had come before and the, uh, uh, the, the, um, uh, Prop 8 case had come to the Supreme Court, which I, I myself was, I was part of the team that brought the, the Prop 8 case to the Supreme Court. Um, but it was, it was Obergefell that really opened the door and said, all right, all these state level things, we're not going to have the patchwork of laws from state to state. Uh, we are just going to have like every state, you got to do, you got to do marriage. Sorry, everybody, you got to do it. Uh, so these are their, these are their wedding rings. Um, and uh, they are, they're both, uh, uh, they were fused together uh, after John Arthur passed away. Uh, he knew that uh, he was, he was, ill and uh, they knew that he didn't have much time left. Uh, so they flew to a state where they could get married. They stayed on the tarmac. They got married on the tarmac because he wasn't well enough to leave the plane uh, and then flew back home. And that became the basis of, uh, of their lawsuit. Um, that eventually like opened the doors for everyone else to get married in the US. Um, so I want to ask you all, um, looking at these rings, uh, what, what does this bring to mind? And, and when did, you know, what, are, what how, how involved were you in, in marriage equality as, as, a, as a cause? This um, was like, oh, go ahead. As no, please go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I, I was just going to say like this for me as like my, my like LGBTQ activism really kicked into high gear in like 2010. And so this for me was like the biggest thing. I mean, actually behind me um, is the cover of the New York Times from when marriage was legalized in New York state. Um, and it just was so parallel with like the work that I was doing and my personal journey. Um, the DOMA was overturned in 2013 and I got married in 2013. So like everything about this um, fight was so personal, but to bring it back again, like so personal and political for me um, in, in many, many ways. And I think that like, it was one of the first times that I was really conscious that there were a bunch of people sitting in a room making a decision that would like literally change what I could do or not do in a handful of months. And that had certainly happened before, but it was the first time that I was really aware of it. Um, that, that in a way that like really shocked me and made me feel very not good. <laughs> yeah. In, um, uh, in high school, um, we had started protesting. Um, and then when I was in college, um, I joined the Lambda Alliance. Um, and that was kind of one of the big things. And I, I always laugh because I always remember uh, when prop when we were trying to like over you know get prop aid and everything like that and overturn all the different laws this is also in Texas and <laughs> being part of this group um, of advocates and I remember standing outside of uh, the seediest gay club in all of uh, we would travel up and down so we'd go to Dallas Houston San Antonio Austin um, and standing outside of this club in San Antonio uh, like greeting men at the door as they were like leaving glory holes and being like, I know you want to get married. I know that one day you're going to want to get married. And like, the last thing these men were thinking about was marriage at this point, you know? And just being there being like, one of these days you're going to want to get married. Please sign this thing. <laughs> <laughs> so like being out at gay clubs and it was this is the thing that a lot of people forget is one is 
is that Obama was not on board with it from the very beginning. Um, it took a lot of pressure to get Obama on board with it for years. Um, he didn't want to do it in his first term because he wanted to win a second election. And so he was, you know, kind of reticent to the whole thing. Uh, and then also not a lot of gay people also wanted to like talk about marriage. Like this idea of like marriage, that's for heteros. It was a really hard thing in the community to sort of be like, I understand that for so long we've been excluded from this conversation. So this idea that like, would we want to participate in something that's so, I get it, it's for the breeders, I got it. But at the same time, like it's something that should not be denied to us. It's not about whether or not you particularly want to get married right now today. It's about the act of denial. It's about the act of denial for healthcare. It was a healthcare thing. There were so many different kinds of issues that bubbled out. It, it's a, an idea about adoptions. It's an idea about who gets custody of children. There were so many different kinds of issues. And I think at the be very beginning, it was all about like, do you want a wedding? Do you want to get married at Fire Island? That is not what we're talking about. Yeah. What we're talking about are the rights you are being denied by being denied your right to, to get married. And that was really to me when it kind of kicked up into higher gear. Um, and we knew we had a chance to change Obama's mindset about things, you know, cause he was like hip, he was kind of a cool dude. And so he like, you know, and his daughters came out also to say like, we also support gay marriage as well. And so we knew it was, it was only a matter of, of uh, cyber bullying at that moment uh, in the good way. <laughs> <laughs> cyber bullying does work sometimes. <laughs> Use it for good. Use it for good. Uh, yeah. Only for playing uh, politicians. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, um, it was, it was, it's not the kind of happy thing that we think about. Like we fought for, we won and everybody was getting married. It was very complex in the beginning. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I have similar feelings about it, Isabella. Because uh, I, was, I was following the issue as it was developing. Um, and and when, when it all happened, I remember watching the news live online we were waiting for that news to break it was so exciting and then as i got older and i started learning more about queer history and and doing all this studying about assimilation and 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 imitating heteronormative life i sort of lost interest in the idea of marriage and and of course i believe we should have all the same rights that heterosexuals have and we also have the right to not get married and we, we have the right to do whatever we want hopefully we have the same rights as everyone else I, it's often felt a lot like the modern version of put on a suit and tie if you wanna go pick it for gay rights or put on your dress and heels if you're a woman, if you wanna pick it for gay rights. And, and I think a lot of people still in our own community hold up marriage as the finish line for our movement. Uh, people at the One Archives, the, the largest LGBTQ archive in the world have said, donations basically stopped when marriage equality happened because people it didn't feel like it was important anymore. You know, we got what we wanted. Now pull the ladder up. We don't need to help trans people. We don't need to help people of color. We don't. We don't need to keep the movement going. Oh yeah, oh yeah. That was that was a big issue. You know, that was the big the big kind of deal. It was it was this kind of idea of acceptance amongst the heteronormative kind of idea of what you know you could be. Um, and uh, yeah, you're so right about that, like how it just dipped down, the conversation of gay rights kind of dipped down because all that was left was this conversation that was about the, like I said earlier, the, the inner biases inside of the community. Um, mm -hmm. And that's a much harder conversation to have. So, yeah. It's, yeah, it's like marriage, you know, like if, when marriage was slid across the table, it was like, so this is enough, like this is enough. Yeah. But the truth of the matter is that like, when you really look at why marriage had been illegal in this country for so long, like it wasn't necessarily because people were uh, queer, it was because of ideas around gender, like it all goes down, it, like it all goes back to that. And so like, you know, marriage equality, you know, it was a massive thing. A ma a mass it can't, cannot be unsaid that it was a massive thing for so many reasons. I have friends who had to like adopt their first children in, in partnerships and then their second kid, they didn't have to do that. It was big in, in ways that are, you know, immeasurable, but um, I think it also, like you're both saying, like it just highlights the fact that um, there are a lot of people who are willing to say like, okay, you can have this cookie, but like, we're not gonna actually talk about the, the root of this issue. We don't wanna face that. 
Yeah, you know, I've had complicated feelings about marriage my whole life. Um, and um, really, like, it, it was a crisis for me uh, for a while. Like, why why am I not married? I'm, I'm literally working with the legal team that's filing a lawsuit before the Supreme Court. What am I doing? Uh, I've been with my partner now for about 20 years, uh, and we're not married. Uh, and something that really made it make sense to me is um, a quote uh, I heard at a dinner, uh, Angela Davis was speaking, uh, and she said that it is possible, she was, uh, specifically about marriage equality, she said it is possible to recognize the moral imperative of legal equality while still being radically critical of the institution. And I was like, oh, of course, of course, you you made it all, you crystallized it all, and that is, that is like the, just the perfect way of, of, of looking at that issue. Yeah, and the, the opportunity for us to redefine what a marriage means, mm -hmm. you know, that's the opportunity. We can do better, yeah. We can do better, yes, you know? And like so many times, you know, my, my favorite thing to tweet out is like, are the straights okay? Um, because <laughs> <laughs> it's always- no. <laughs> they <laughs> never the are. <laughs> Literally never. <laughs> But, you know, like so many times you'll see like memes from straight people about their marriage and how dysfunctional and like horrible and toxic it is, you know, and in that I see like we are reimagining what marriage, what a marriage can be, you know, I remember the conversations when my friends were first getting married and people would be like, well, who's the wife, who's the husband, you know, and like having to, to be like that binary does not exist to us. We do not come from that same sort of a thing, you know, and we have sort of, and I think that that's bleeding out into the general kind of conversation that now more people who are in traditional style marriages are starting to understand gender norms, the binary, all of those things are not set in stone. Um, and that if you start to re-examine what a marriage is just on two people, maybe three, maybe four, I am not judging, like, you know, whatever a, a union is, that it, it does not, it can be defined by the people inside of it, not the culture itself, not the society defining it. So um, I think that, yeah, marriage equality uh, reverberates throughout the entire culture. Um, and nobody has a more amazing wedding uh, than queer people. My God, the, the spectacle of it all, okay. <laughs> Well, there is so much more to say about all of these artifacts, and we've only just scratched the surface of the conversations that can be had uh, about every single one of these images. Um, and fortunately, a fantastic place to continue those conversations is at Mopop here in Seattle uh, at the exhibit Rise Up Stonewall and the LGBTQ Rights Movement. It's going to be at Mopop until September, uh, presented in partnership with the Freedom Forum. So I do urge everybody to go check out uh, that exhibit over at Mopop. And, and a huge thanks to, to Mopop for hosting this uh, panel and, and for making this conversation possible. Um, so uh, I want to go around and just ask everybody uh, where folks can find you. Let's start with Kristen. Uh, well, you can find me on social media, fortunately or unfortunately for me. Uh, my my handle is Kristen Nolene, um, and you can find the work that I do with LGBTQ communities using that. I'm going to spell it for you because nobody knows how to spell Nolene. It's K-R-I-S-T-I-N. N-O-E-L-I-N-E. -E, uh, and I also host a Buffy the Vampire Slayer podcast called Buffering the Vampire Slayer, which is really queer and really patriarchy smashing. So come on over and hang out. <laughs> Fantastic. Good. Doing great work. Uh, Devlin, how, uh, how about you? Where can folks find you? Uh, you can find me mostly on Instagram at Queer Serial. It's serial with an S. Uh, my podcast is the serialized uh, history of queer liberation in America from the beginning of the 1920s all the way through uh, the year following Stonewall. And right now I'm releasing the third and final season. So you'll hear some of like the biggest pickets and riots and Stonewall and, and a lot of really big events. Um, and I post a lot of images from those things on Instagram at Queer Serial. Fantastic. I'm a big fan of that podcast and not just because I was briefly on it. Uh, so <laughs> thanks for joining us. episodes, he's fab. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and Isabella, where can folks find you online? Um, you can find me online um, at Izzy Von Gool on Twitter and Isabella Von Gool on Instagram. Uh, I also have a monthly series at the Langston Center uh, where we discuss films and Black media and how Black media um, impacts the representation that Black people experience in real life. And I'm also one of the curators for the SIF programming as well. So uh, yeah, those are the places that you can find me. 
Awesome. Uh, yes. And oh, with any luck, we will be back to having in-person events soon because I really enjoy the screenings that you host. Oh, thanks, man. <laughs> um, and I've been Matt Baum. Uh, you can find me online uh, at my website, mattbaum.com, where I got a little newsletter about all the stuff that I'm working on. You can also check me out on YouTube, where I do a video series about queer episodes of television. Just posted a video. Oh, goodness. I've had a bunch about uh, friends, uh, about the nanny. I'm working on one about uh, queer animation of the 90s right now. So that's been an adventure. Uh, so check that out at youtube.com slash mattbaum or uh, my website, mattbaum.com. And if you're in Seattle and you like uh, knowing what's going on, check me out on The Stranger. I write, uh, cover the queer uh, beat for The Stranger and also geeks and uh, with increasing frequency, the furry fandom. So uh, check out all three of those uh, interests intersecting uh, over at The Stranger. Want to send a big thank you to Mopop for hosting this panel and to Seattle Pride for uh, making this possible. Uh, big thanks also to the Freedom Forum for putting together the uh, exhibit that uh, we've been talking about. And to everybody who is a part of this panel and everybody who's watching, thanks so much for joining and we will see you out in the streets.